Okay, so you probably know I'm an engineer. Uh, my only qualifications for condo historian are that nobody else wanted the job. So if my story is a little bit too much about who invented what first, uh, that's my inner engineer you're hearing. Uh, okay, so let's begin. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to get uh, perspective on something is to stand way back from it and take a look at it from a distance. So my plan for today is to show you how we get from certain historical events to a modern uh, condominium community. Uh, we'll uh, take a look at some of the uh, early days of colonial America when slave-based plantations were just developing in Rhode Island. Uh, we'll also take a look at the American Revolution and at the Civil War. Uh, we'll look at the Industrial Revolution uh, when this country was fundamentally transforming itself. Uh, we'll look at the uh, era of cottages when there were uh, rich people uh, surrounded by swarms of servants. And uh, ultimately, uh, hopefully, we'll wind up in the modern era. Uh, I also plan to uh, talk about uh, some uh, great figures of history like Roger Williams and George Washington. And believe it or not, I have 45 minutes to get all this done. So this is Shadow Farm. It's located on a tiny part of the huge and unpronounceable Petaquamscot Purchase of 1658, got through it. Uh, same name as our host, the unpronounceable Petaquamscot Historical Society. By the 18th century, the land is owned by Deputy Governor uh, William Robinson. Robinson is a, a slave-owning plantation owner who builds a big house on the shore of the future Silver Lake. Uh, Robinson also happens to breed a special kind of horse. And we'll get back to the horses. Okay, uh, just to orient you a little bit, um, here's Shadow Farm in the yellow. Uh, you can see it's uh, situated on a big lake, uh, that Shadow, uh, that Silver Lake. Uh, it has a main entrance over here on North Kingstown Road, a couple of blocks down from the big intersection with Main Street and Old Tower Hill Road, and the. Uh, uh, we'll also be we'll be speaking about the uh, Hazard Mills, which are located up here at Peacedale, and uh, then over here is the world famous uh, Lugens Library, where we're currently situated. This is Shadow Farm's oldest structure, Manor House. Manor House is divided into six uh, nice living units. Uh, over here at the other end of the property, there are structures which were uh, at one time a carriage house and a barn, and uh, they are uh, were converted into 15 uh, nice living units. The rest of us live in homes like these arranged in seven clusters around the property. Shadow Farm abuts Silver Lake. In the old days, Silver Lake was called Tupper's Pond. Uh, we have 81 residents, 512 trees, 60 homes, part of that lake, and many stone walls. Not sure how many stone walls, I never counted them. The first Americans deserve to be called by their right name, Native Americans, but sometimes I call them Indians, the name they got stuck with when Columbus got confused about where he landed. I know that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, and for that, I apologize. And sometimes I call the colonists the white man, which I know that's just as bad, probably worse. Uh, after all, they weren't all guys, and uh, they weren't even all white. The, uh, you may not know this, the first colonist killed in the revolution uh, was an African-American. Uh, the reason uh, that I do that, the reason that I use that nomenclature is because I find it confuses people if I try to put uh, modern words into the mouths of historical figures.
I'd like to start with a word about our founder, Roger Williams. You've heard of him, right? So I don't know what Roger Williams actually looks like. Uh, there don't seem to be any drawings or paintings that survived. I couldn't find a single selfie. I did find the drawing in the upper right hand corner. So that's obviously based on guesswork because uh, back then we know that preachers were clean shaven. So let's, uh, let's kind of remove the facial hair. Now, uh, Williams was a crusader for freedom of religion. And he also fought for the rights of Native Americans. Uh, Williams argued for separation of church and state. And he founded Rhode Island, as uh, you probably know that one. And he was our first governor. Roger Williams was brilliant. He was gifted and he was resourceful. So here's the part you probably don't know. Uh, he was a lunatic. In uh, 1630, uh, Roger Williams takes uh, holy orders to the Church of England, and then he proceeds to kind of drive everybody crazy. Uh, he has lots of ideas on how to reform his church, which he considers corrupt and false. Unfortunately, King James isn't known for his progressive views on religious tolerance, and dissenters in England have a tendency to die uh, quite young. In 1631, Roger wisely decides to sail to Massachusetts Bay Colony, where he hopes to resume his career as a preacher. When Roger gets to Boston, he tells everyone the Indians are as good as the white man. He tells everyone people should be free to follow their conscience in religious matters. He also says the crown has no right to be giving away the land of the Indians. And he says ministers who accept pay for their services are sellouts. He also says he doesn't like that the church still has connections with the Church of England. It should separate completely. When he realizes he's getting on people's nerves, he goes to Salem, where he grates on people's nerves too. So he goes to Plymouth, where he denounces the hireling ministers for accepting pay and not separating sufficiently from England. That doesn't help his popularity with the ministers of Plymouth. Uh, and in the meantime, to make a living, young Williams, who has a special talent for languages, teaches himself Algonquin so he can trade with the Wampanoag and Narragansett tribes. As he comes to admire the Indians, he makes sure to use their noble ways to shame his fellow colonists, endearing himself even more to them. I guess you can see where this is headed. Pretty soon, it's agreed to be best if Williams is sent back to England on the next boat. Which is fine, except that he escapes into the woods where the Wampanoag shelter him through the winter. I need to fast forward a little here due to time constraints. Besides, you already know our founder does great. If I painted him as a madman, I apologize. I'm just having fun. He's actually a remarkable guy. His idealism, which annoys his peers, makes sense to the modern ear. Not all of it, but a lot of it. His amazing talent for understanding language and culture leads eventually to his playing a crucial role in negotiations with the tribes. My favorite story takes place in 1676 when the Indians are furious, justifiably furious, at the colonists for massacring hundreds of their tribe at the Great Swamp. The Wampanoag and the Narragansett are so mad they decide to unite and teach the English a lesson. When the colonists get word of this, they freak out. Their muskets are really kinds of clumsy instruments and they aren't worth much against waves of seasoned resolute warriors. A Narragansett Wampanoag enemy uh, would be a truly existential threat to them. So what do they do? They turn to the only person who could possibly get the Indians to call it off. Who's that? 
That's the lunatic, of course, the only white man the tribes trust, the only one who has even a remote chance of making them change their minds. Now, uh, until now, Rogers managed to get the Narragansetts to stay neutral against the colonies. So his peers ask him to please use his magic to stave off disaster just one more time. All right, so this is how it goes. Uh, the two tribes are meeting to forge a peace treaty between them uh, where they're going to pl uh, plot the downfall of the occupiers. There are a thousand gigantic battle-scarred warriors getting themselves all worked up about the white man. And I mean, I mean, these guys are huge. They're at least a head taller than the average colonist. No sane European, no, no sane person would get any place close to this situation. So who walks into their midst unarmed? Who else? Roger Crazy Horse Williams, who immediately starts arguing with the Narragansetts, telling them they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. He tries bluffing, which doesn't work, and then he tries negotiating, uh, but nothing works. And in the end, he fails, and they turn him down, which means tragically means that they'll uh, shortly launch a war against the white man in which Providence gets burned down. Uh, both sides uh, suffer horrible losses, and of course, uh, the Indians uh, wind up losing the war. But Williams is held in such high esteem by the Indians that they go out of their way to make sure that he gets home safe. Well, Roger Williams would have turned over in his grave if he could have seen pre-revolutionary Rhode Island. Believe it or not, our South County was once called South Country because of the way it resembles the uh, slave-owning South. One in four people in South Country are slaves. South Country is famous for its beautiful, productive plantations based on forced labor, slavery, in other words. With its great shipping fleet, uh, Rhode Islanders also make money on the slave trade. It's a rich place. And if you're lucky and free, uh, Rhode Island's the place to be. The only problem is that England wants a cut of all this, and that infuriates the proud Rhode Islanders. When the revolution comes along, they join right up. The American Revolution starts off with a bang. After Lexington and Concord, where the British are driven back, we're very impressed with ourselves. Unfortunately, that doesn't last long. Somebody apparently forgets to take into consideration that the English are much better able to field an army since they can actually feed them, clothe them, and provide them with muskets and gunpowder, none of which the wretched colonists can. After a while, our freezing, starving, disillusioned soldiers start sneaking home. Things are so bad that General Washington puts fake gunpowder casks filled with sand where they can sp be spotted by British spies, the idea being to fool them into thinking that we can actually fight back, which we can't. Things suck. So what should be done? We need help from somewhere, and we know the French aren't big on the English since they had just recently been creamed in the Seven Year War. Uh, but that certainly doesn't mean that the French would intervene on our behalf. Uh, maybe there's somebody who could persuade them to take our side. Well, old Ben Franklin is wildly popular in Europe. He's the father of electricity. He's an intellectual. And although the term scientist won't be coined until the middle of the 1800s, he is every bit the scientist. They ask him to go to France. Now, going to France isn't a carnival cruise line kind of thing back then. Their ships are god-awful, and Franklin has gout and kidney stones. But he says yes. Okay, hold the presses a minute. As Franklin's gearing up for the long, scary sail to Europe, word comes down to the colonial government that the Queen, a lady named Marie Antoinette, would like a pair of Narragansett pacers, the very same horses, that Governor William Robinson is raising on the future shadow farmland. 
Now, why does she want these particular horses? Well, everybody wants pacers. They're the best riding horses in the world. George Washington has one and Paul Revere has one. Uh, supposedly, uh, a pacer is a Paul Revere's mount for the famous midnight ride. Uh, so because these horses are so popular, uh, the colonies are thinking about using a pair of pacers to strengthen their ties with the French. Franklin arrives to adoring crowds and a suspicious king. The king's reluctant to put his toes into our mess. He's intrigued, but he's careful. Franklin works slowly on his majesty, eventually winning French diplomatic recognition for the United States in December of 1977. The following year, France and the United States sign a treaty, and with the support of France, the Americans win their war against England. So what about the horses? I'm sorry, but I don't know if Marie Antoinette gets her pacers. By then, the queen has bigger problems. The peasants are mad at her over the price of bread. They claim, not without cause, that Marie and Louis are profligate spenders. So this is not a good time for them to be bragging about a, a great pair of horses they just got. But with or without their majesties, the list of distinguished pacer owners is long. The pacer era is a significant historical milestone for Shadow Farm. Okay, uh, now let's advance the calendar to about 1800. We're on the land where Shadow Farm will one day exist. Nearby is a wooden building where Joseph Congdon and John Knowles are using machinery uh, to process wool. Their machine cards wool into rolls for the first time ever. Carding is, is a process where you kind of comb out the wool. Uh, a 41-year-old merchant named Roland Hazard pays them a visit. Hazard's so impressed he joins the firm and then ultimately buys them out entirely. Hazard isn't the only one who sees the potential of technology for the new world. Uh, Sam Slater builds a mill incorporating things he learned as a mill foreman in England. And Francis Cabot Lowell up in Massachusetts is a first class innovator. Hazard, Lowell and Slater together will profoundly change America. <laughs> Well, Roland's dad is Tom Hazard, a Quaker preacher. His mother is a daughter of William Robinson, the one who raises the Pacer horses. Uh, it's on Robinson's land that Shadow Farm will someday be built. By 1815, Hazard's operating the first power loom in North America. He uses water to spin cotton, that's a first. And by 1820, uh, the uh, mill is a production line. Raw material goes in one end, uh, finished goods out the other, and all under one roof. And that's a first in America. As Roland ramps up production in his mill, he has to figure out where he can sell large quantities of woolen cloth. That's where things get real interesting. Uh, there are already textile makers in the area selling slave cloth, a rough, uh, scratchy, uncomfortable fabric to plantations in the South. Plantation owners need uh, cheap, durable cloth. Hand weaving is too expensive for slaves. And uh, this, is, this is cold to say, but to them, slaves are a business proposition. A good slave uh, costs plenty to buy, and ownership costs can chew up up to 90% of the revenue from cotton sales. And so, yeah, you can actually, you can own slaves, have free labor, and you can actually lose money. So this is where Kersey comes into the picture. Kersey or slave cloth is one way to hold down expenses. Kersey's cheap, and it's especially so the way it's being made up north at this time. So uh, Roland goes into the Kersey business, selling his slave cloth to plantations. Uh, soon the sons uh, join him, Isaac, Roland, G, and Joseph. Uh, the sons are very hardworking. Uh, they expand the mills, and they make improvements uh, to the entire community. They even change the name of the adjacent town to Wakefield, uh, probably, I imagine, because McCoon's Mill uh, just doesn't sound right to Quaker ears. 
Okay, so you're probably wondering where they park the sightseeing buses so people can get tickets to the big museum where they can learn all about the hazards. Well, I'm sorry, there's no museum. Uh, so far, we're undiscovered. Uh, maybe now that I got the word out, that will change. Let's hope. All right, back to my story. <clears throat> Quakers don't like slavery, and the hazards, they're very much Quakers. Uh, Roland G. Hazard feels it's absurd to be crusading against slavery as a Quaker at the same time you're profiting from slavery. This motivates him to help people in many, many ways, and beyond that, it makes him fearless in opposition to slavery. He risks economic ruin and even death to do what's right. The most notorious example of this takes place in 1841. Dozens of former slaves are captured and re-enslaved in New Orleans. This is illegal, even by the uh, laws of the time. When Hazard hears about it, he goes nuts. He travels down to New Orleans and he risks his life to get the former uh, slaves freed in court. When word gets out, this infuriates the plantation owners. They aren't happy about buying cloth from a Yankee ra uh, rabble rouser. Uh, business dries up at the mills, forcing the Hazards to convert their operation to making woolen shawls for women and clothing for the Union Army, ending, finally, at long last, their complicity in slavery. By the way, if you think I'm making up the stuff about Peacedale and slave cloth, drive over to where the last mill buildings sit. Uh, you'll see a street sign that says Kersey Road. I went over there and I asked uh, people along the road if they knew what the sign meant, and they didn't. So you are now one of the few people who know that that sign means slave cloth. When William Robinson dies, his vast land holdings are divided among his six sons, and in 1869, one of them sells a 60-acre tract to a guy named uh, John Strang, S-T-R-A-N-G, of New York. So this land is located in a small town, uh, which has a tavern, a stagecoach uh, stop, a blacksmith shop, a church, a couple of mills. So it's kind of a typical little town back then. Air conditioning doesn't exist yet. The best way to get through the summer, if you can afford it, is to have a house near the shore. The spot the Strangs find has a beautiful lake. It's also near the shore. There's a railroad directly to the uh, shore, and the house they build will eventually become Shadow Farms Manor House. The property is near the fast-growing Narragansett Pier area, where they're throwing up hotels as fast as they can build them. Narragansett Pier is on its way to rivaling Newport as a mecca for rich socialites. They're building tennis courts and golf courses and exclusive clubs. Uh, soon there will be an elegant casino catering to the very rich. The Strands chose well. In 1884, Strang hires architect Douglas Smith to remodel his house. The design is along the lines of the cottages in, Ar in Newport and in Narragansett. The Strang era doesn't last long. Strang dies in 1898, and his widow sells to a Philadelphian named John Welsh. The Welsh fortune comes from coal. The Welshes enlarge the house and add an extensive complex of semi-conducted outbuildings. They also add a laundry, and later they add a greenhouse and an electric generator, which lights, lets them light up the house with Edison's electric light bulbs. There's also a cow barn, stables, pastures, a bunkhouse for the mail workers, a dog kennel, a boathouse, and there's a five-car garage with living quarters for the chauffeur. The Welshes are big entertainers, often dining with other wealthy people. Uh, they're avid horseback riders and tennis players. Uh, they're members of the Dunes Club. They love the beaches, and they have a 150-foot yacht named Tuna. Life is great except if you're one of the 20 field hands or the two butlers, the cook, the scullery maid, the upstairs maid, the downstairs maid, the laundress, the waitress, the ladies maid, or the nurse maid, working your asses off to make all this possible. The wealth difference is stark between the Welshes and the people who take care of them. 
The last member of the Welsh family, Mrs. Roberts, formerly Sarah Welsh, was raised on the property. Her coming out party is fabulous, as is her wedding to Mr. Roberts. Mrs. Roberts has high expectations of her workers. They say she carefully counted out the change to the penny. Being a servant for someone like Mrs. Roberts is better than being a slave, obviously. But the hours are long and the work is physically demanding. Working conditions are fair at best. The gardener's wife says that her house smells like high heavens because of its proximity to the barn. And I really don't think she had plumbing or central heating, although I'm not exactly sure about that. Still, it's very clear that workers feel very lucky to have their jobs. Well, nothing is forever. On this chart, I've shown some of the signature events that I just described versus population growth. Uh, you can see uh, you can see over here that the population is beginning to level out. That would be, I think, that would be somewhere near the uh, oh, late 1970s. And you can see there's a white elephant staring back at us somewhere in that area, uh, because that's near the end of the Welsh era. Because uh, by the 1970s, air conditioners are becoming common, and the railroad line out to the shore is now gone, replaced by the automobile. The era of Grand Summer Estates is over. The Welsh property is a white elephant. The socialite scene is fading. There's nothing to draw families like the Welsh's to Narragansett anymore. So part of the land is sold off. A local builder, Goudreau Development, eyes the remaining 32 acres. And they wonder, uh, would the old Welsh lands be suitable for condominiums? The idea at first seems a bit crazy. The property is an overgrown maze of stone walls, horse pastures, elaborate barns, and nondescript sheds. The only existing structure that remotely makes sense for this purpose is the gracious but now dilapidated big house. It's far from obvious how the creaky old mansion can be divided into separate units. Goudreau's Dave Twombly isn't worried about it. He likes challenges. So working with architect William Shopson and Huygens and Tappy Incorporated, a Boston architect, he explores several proposals with the town beginning, I think, in 1979. One proposal expands the big house to a size of 3,000 square feet with an elegant 200-seat restaurant. There's also a 12,000 square foot commercial space with a glass-enclosed winter garden. Ultimately, the number of units is reduced to 60 units. The restaurants and shops are dropped. The goal, as they say it, is to preserve existing structures where possible, preserve the water quality of the lake, and respect the neighborhood, minimizing the impact on the surroundings. The clubhouse and pool never make it into the final design. The tennis court does. There are boating and swimming facilities at the lake. The final design is ingenious. It turns the Welsh white elephant into lovely differentiated living spaces. Each one is more surprising than the next. Better Homes and Gardens and the National Association of Home Builders award Goudreau Development a 1980 Sensible Growth Award of Merit. Uh, Dave Twombly, uh, the Vice President of Goudreau, uh, is, uh, says he's obviously very proud of the national recognition. Uh, he describes Shadow Farm as a sensitive piece of property that requires a sensitive approach to development. This is the groundbreaking ceremony with everybody looking a little bit silly. So a recession derails their plans for a while.
they sweated out. Uh, this is the 1980 recession before things start to move, but eventually all 60 units are sold, built, and occupied. My story ends as Shadow Farm becomes a viable community. It might seem a little strange to end where Shadow Farm begins. What kind of history is that? Shouldn't a history of Shadow Farm cover the years since 1982? History didn't stop in 1982. Lots of things happened here. We, like other condo communities, learn to govern ourselves. People came and went on our boards and our various committees. Lawns were cut, snow was plowed, repairs were made, fees were collected. But things, while not perfect, weren't extraordinary enough to make it into those history books. As one of the owners at Shadow Farm, I can attest to the great success of Goudreau's vision. So this, more or less, brings us into the modern era. It's been a delight to share with you what I learned working as our local historian. Uh, I expect to keep adding to what I've learned, and who knows, maybe someday I'll even do this again. Thank you so much.